Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to our worship here at Grace Fellowship this morning. So the calendar says May 1. Um, it seems like we are in a time warp or something because it sure seems like March 1 this morning, but we know we serve a faithful God who controls the seasons and holds that all in his hand. And we serve and worship a God of great things who has done many wonderful things for us. So we invite you to join us in praise of our God this morning. has done great things and you know the Bible is full of the stories of the wonders and the miracles and all the many wonderful acts of God but unfortunately it's also a lot of stories of forgetfulness 
of the people forgetting, people of God forgetting what he had done for them. We think of all the signs and wonders that God performed in the land of Egypt and how he parted the Red Sea for the people to go through. But then not that long later, we read how the people felt they were better off if they had been back in Egypt in slavery. And we think, how could they forget? But in Isaiah, it says, all of us are like sheep that go astray, and we want to go our own way, and we want to forget the ways of God. But God, in his mercy, provides a way back through the work of Jesus Christ, and he longs for us to live in that freedom that we just sung about, and longs for us to live as his children, the amazing thing that God calls us. Join us as we continue to worship. Oh uh-huh. 
Who does God say that we are? We are his children. And in Colossians it says we are holy and dearly loved. And so as God's beloved children, we share the same father. And that makes us brothers and sisters, right? So this morning, I invite you to greet your brothers and sisters. Maybe even say, good morning, brother. Good morning, sister. Um, Greet your family here at Grace and also God's family joining us on Facebook this morning. Good morning. And if this is your first time joining this branch of God's family, if this is your first time here, make sure that you stop at the Ask Me booth back there if you haven't already and get a, a gift bag. We'd like to welcome you here. And inside that bag, there's a Connect card. And really for anybody here, if you've got prayer requests or you want to share something, this is one way that you can do that. You can connect with us. This is a way to stay linked in, um, to just... Uh, know what's going on here at Grace Fellowship, things you might be interested in joining us. So those are at the Ask Me booth out in the lobby. Um, the next sermon series that's starting not today, but next week Sunday, Pastor Chris is going to um, share some things about the Apostles' Creed, and he has a little teaser video for us here to share, so we'll watch that. word credo from which we derive the word creed means I believe and in our next sermon series we are going to unpack the refreshing and empowering core beliefs of the Apostles Creed the early church composed this document to sum up the teachings of the Apostles like Peter and Paul and it is triune in nature reflecting a God who is Father Son and Holy Spirit and what we believe about this triune God affects how we live and understand ourselves and the world around us. Churches across the globe have been confessing this creed for centuries. And in our next sermon series, we're going to join them as we experience and confess what we believe. All right, so we're hopeful that you can join us next week and find out more about that. But between now and next week, there's one little thing that's going to happen. It's Marlo. Marlo, what are you doing? Marlo, no, no, Marlo, tulip time is this week. It wasn't this, no, those aren't leftover strope waffles. No, no, we're... <laughs> well, come back on Thursday, and then we will have... Thousands of strope waffles to sell. Yes, thank you, Marlo. We'll look forward to that. <laughs> so, yes, tulip time starts Thursday morning, and some of us have been preparing for it for the last, um, yeah, the rest of our lives, it feels like. Um, 
So if you would like to help in the Grace booth this tulip time, there are, I just looked last night, there are lots of slots left, especially afternoons and evenings, the 3 to 5, 5 to 7, 7 to 9. So, um, and there are also morning and after, early afternoon shifts too. So if you're interested in helping, we'd love to have you join us. Um, you can sign up. Uh, there's a Sign Up Genius. The link is on Faith Life. Danielle has also sent out some emails with that link. And so, um, or you can talk to me. You can talk to Danielle, Larry Hanthorn. Um, several others are on the, let's see, Wayne, you can talk to Marlo, you can talk to, we'll help you. <laughs> so get signed up. Um, so tulip time is coming, and we'd love to see you in the Grace booth. It's fun. It really is. It's work, but it's fun, and it's a good time to get to know your brothers and sisters a little better, elbow to elbow. Um, so speaking of faith life, um, you should have received an invitation to join faith life. I am a fan of Faith Life because I can post things on Faith Life and I don't have to text somebody or email to somebody and then wait for them to send it out to somebody else. I can just post things myself. Um, if you have a prayer request, if you want to know uh, when are there shifts available for tulip time, you can just go to Faith Life, go to the Grace Fellowship Group, and you can uh, get connected in so many ways with so many things. So I encourage you to... Um, get connected with Faith Life. Um, you can also give via Faith, Faith Life. Um, you can give, you can text, um, you can go to our website, and you can also give right here in the building. There are baskets, and this is kind of the time in our worship service that we do that. Um, we have two ways you can give. You can give to the mission of Grace Fellowship to reach up, reach out, grow together, the baskets in the back by the doors. And then we also have um, little treasure chests, which we call the Four Corners offering, which we give to ministries around our community and in our world. And this month, the Four Corners offering is um, through the CRC World Renew Ukrainian response. So I'm sure we've all seen this, the devastation that's taking place in Ukraine and the refugees who are fleeing. Um, and so if you want to support them in some way, um, Christian Reformed Church World Renew is working with that situation. So you're welcome to now or really any point before you leave um, the four corners or the baskets in the back. And I think that's it. Good morning. Good morning. Let's, there we go. Good morning. At this time, I would like to invite forward any children who would like to join us for the children's message up front today. Um, and I'm going to have you sit kind of in that same way that we did earlier. How is everyone today? Good. How are you, Kip? Are you good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Come on up. Let's make, let's make room for um, Christopher and Isaac. Where do you want to sit? Awesome. Today, um, Pastor Chris is going to talk to us about a chapter in the Bible called Matthew, it's Matthew 18. Has anybody ever heard of it before? All right, so it might be a little familiar. There's actually kind of three parts, three different parts of Matthew 18. And for the first part, I just, I just wanna read it to you guys. Maybe you've never heard it before, and maybe you didn't know about some of the things that are in this first part. But this whole first part of Matthew 18 it's about you guys. It's about children. So I'll read it to you. About the same time, the disciples came to Jesus asking, who gets the highest rank in God's kingdom? What do you think he said? Our children. Huh? Our children. Our children. For an answer, Jesus called over a child whom he stood in the middle of the room and said, I'm telling you once and for all that unless you return to square one and start over like children, you're not even going to get a look at the kingdom, let alone get in. Whoever becomes simple and eternal and 
Whoever becomes simple and elemental again, like this child, will rank high in God's kingdom. What's more, when you receive the childlike on my account, it's the same thing as receiving me. But if you give them a hard time, anybody ever given you a hard time? They're not sitting in this room, are they? Yes, no. Yeah, they are. All right. We have, we have part three that will help fix that. Okay. But if you give them a hard time bullying or taking advantage of their simple trust, you'll soon wish you hadn't. You'd be better off dropped in the middle of the lake with a millstone around your neck. Doom to the world for giving these child-believing children a hard time. Hard times are inevitable, but you don't have to make it worse, and it's doomsday if you do. Ooh. If your hand or your foot gets in the way of God, chop it off, throw it away. What? You're better off maimed or lame and alive than proud owners of two hands and two feet, godless in a furnace of eternal fire. And if your eye distracts you from God, pull it out, throw it away. You're better off one eye than alive than exercising your 2020 vision from inside the fire of hell. Watch that you don't treat a single one of these childlike believers arrogantly. You realize, don't you, that their personal angels are constantly in touch with my, he with my Father in heaven. Let me read that last part again, because maybe you guys don't realize some of the things God already has in place for you. Watch that you don't treat a single one of these childlike believers arrogantly. You realize, don't you, that their personal angels are constantly in touch with my Father in heaven. You all have personal angels that are constantly in touch with God, right? All right, so before we get to part two, I want to set this up a little bit. Um, if I had my notes written on a piece of paper and on the way into the worship center I ripped them, how would I fix that? Tape. Tape? Yeah. All right. Can you fix this for me? Quickly, because my notes are on there. Okay. Oh. Well, yeah, that was just a setup for the story. Say I got in the mail last week my bank statement from Marion County State Bank, and I have a problem because the number on this page doesn't match the number in my checkbook. So how would I fix that? Thank you. Call Ron. Call Ron. Right. What? The funny thing is, is that Ron works at Marion County Bank. So what would you do? How would you fix that? Okay, so maybe it was a math error, right? So what is 50 minus 100? Um, that's Ooh, that's right where the problem is. <laughs> Thanks for that, guys. <laughs> Say I have a van out in the parking lot that the trim is starting to kind of peel off on the side and it flaps sometimes in the wind. What would I use to fix that? Glue. Glue. You'd probably go get some of this, right? And then you'd promise yourself on some spring day where it's not raining or windy, you were going to fix it. Do you think it's fixed yet? No. no. Sure isn't. And I don't know about you guys, but I have this pot, pan, whatever you want to call it at home. Notice anything about the handle? Uh, it is. And if you look here on the bottom, what does it look like? So how would we fix that? Tighten it. Tighten it. Use a screwdriver. Like this? Awesome. Let's see. I know. I know. I thought about that when I got up here. That wasn't very tricky. Yeah, make sure you're tightening it. Oh, look. It doesn't rattle anymore. Yeah, awesome. So thanks for helping me fix these things, but I wonder, how do you fix a broken friendship? Okay. Whoa. 
What? Talk it out? Yeah. You can't fix it with tape or plastic emblem adhesive? I think if you tape them, you're going to make it worse. What about a screwdriver? No? Let's see what part two of Matthew 18 tells us, okay? Are you ready? Okay. The second part is titled, Work It Out Between You. Look at it this way. If someone has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off, doesn't he leave the 99 and go after the one? And if he finds it, doesn't he make far more over it than the other 99 who stay put? Your father in heaven feels the same way. He doesn't want to lose even one of his simple believers. If a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him. Work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you've made a friend. If he won't listen, take one or two others with you and try again. If he still won't listen, tell the church. And if he won't listen to the church, you'll have to start over from scratch. Confront him with the need for repent. Just like to start over. Yeah, you'll have to start over from the beginning. Um, You'll have to confront him with the need for repentance and offer again God's forgiving love. Take this most seriously. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven, And a no on earth is a no in heaven. What you say to one another lasts forever. I mean this, when two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. And when two or three of you gather together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. So I don't know if you look around the room real quick, is there more than two or three of us here? Yeah? So what does the Bible say? We're here, and who else is here? God. God. Awesome. Now, part three. Part three kind of goes together with part two. Um, And it's a story about forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Yes. Where you forgive someone. I know, but what does it mean to forgive? Like, if you mess up, then, like, you apologize. Okay. Forgive. It says to stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense, flaw, or mistake. How many of you have been angry at somebody? Because, I don't, it's the microphone. I don't know why it does that, but see Larry back there? Wave Larry. Larry fixes those weird noises for us in the morning. Um, if you want to know what causes it, I bet after church, if you ask him, he would gladly answer it. But anyway, how many of you have ever felt angry towards somebody because they've treated you unfairly or they've been mean? Yes, yeah. Um, it also says to cancel. So maybe if I went to Ron Vanting about my $50 debt that I now owe Marion County Bank because I can't do math, maybe he'll forgive it. Do you think? No, probably. probably not. Anyway, here's a, here's a short story, and I apologize for going a little bit longer than normal. Um, at that point, Peter got up the nerve to ask, Master, how many times do I forgive a brother or sister who hurts me? Seven? Jesus replied, seven? Hardly. Try 70 times seven. Does anybody know how much? Uh, 140, um, 70 times seven. Um, I just want you to know math isn't my thing. I don't know the answer. Does anybody know what 70s? Wait, no, it's, it's 100 times 7 is 20, so it's, no, it's, oh, wait, I know, it's, it's 1,900, it's 1,900. What? So what's our final answer? 490. 490. Yes. Is that true, congregation? Yes. All right. Why didn't they just write that in here? Because I want you to do math. I know. The kingdom of God is like a king who decided to square accounts with his servants. As he got underway, one servant was brought before him who had run up a debt of $100,000. He couldn't pay up, so the king ordered the man, along with his wife and children, so you guys are going too, and the goods and their house to be auctioned off at the slave market. The poor wretch threw himself at the king's feet and begged, Give me a chance, I'll pay it back, all of it. Touched by his plea, the king let him off, erasing the debt, right? 
So now he know he owed a hundred thousand dollars, and now he owes nothing. nothing. The servant who was no sooner out of the room when he came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him ten dollars, and he grabbed him by the throat and he said, "Pay up now." And the poor wretch threw himself down and begged, "Give me a chance, and I'll pay it all back." What do you think he did? He erased his debt. He did not. He wouldn't do it. He had him arrested and put him in jail until the debt was paid. When the other servants saw this going on, they were outraged, and they brought a detailed report to the king. Guess what the king did? Put his debt back. Put his debt back and put him in prison until he could pay back the entire debt. So where he was forgiven, did he forgive the next person who owed him? Is that good or bad? Two, that's two thumbs down, right? All right. And I just, before we end in, in prayer today, I wanted to share something that I found um, while I was looking. Um, and it's something to look, f- for you guys to look to your future with, okay? Are you ready? It says, whether it's a simple spat with your husband or wife or a long-held resentment towards a family member or friend, Unresolved conflict can go deeper than you may realize. It may be affecting your physical health. The good news, studies have found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health, lowering the risk of heart attack, improving cholesterol levels and sleep, and reducing pain, blood pressure, and levels of anxiety, depression, and stress just by using forgiveness. What? Isn't that crazy? All right. Will you join me and we'll pray and then we'll go back to our seats. Okay. Dear God, we thank you for worship this morning. Please protect the flock of children under the care of Grace Fellowship. We ask that as we go through life experiencing broken friendships, that you help us with fixing them. When we find it hard to forgive someone, please help us to remember all of the times that you forgave us. In your son's holy name we pray, amen. 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 You know why I prayed up here? Because God's up there. When I was six, I had a stuffed monkey named Willie. Feel free to laugh. I took that monkey everywhere. Vacations, sleepovers, you name it. Life was good for a boy and his monkey. Until one day, we got in an argument. And I don't remember the subject matter or whatever the incident was that caused this discord. But from that moment on, we were not the best of friends. And for a period of time, Willie sat on a shelf next to a bear named Bobo. And conflict does that. It has a way of causing real people to see and treat each other differently. And sometimes someone might hurt you intentionally, maybe something they say or they do. And rather than have a heart-to-heart conversation, sometimes we just put that relationship on the shelf, which is why Jesus says these words to his followers in Matthew chapter 18, or page 952 in those brown church Bibles. Beginning at verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And if they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a 
tax collector. And John Ortberg, he breaks down this passage in seven simple steps. He says, if there's a conflict, you go to the person to discuss in private, to discuss the problem for the purpose of reconciliation. He says, if there's a conflict, you go to the person in private to discuss the problem for the purpose of reconciliation. And he notes that, that this command, these instructions are probably the most not followed instructions Jesus ever gave humanity. And Rick Warren notes that nobody taught us how to do this. He says our parents didn't teach us, their parents didn't teach them, and there was no class in school on conflict resolution, yet these are the most important life skills you will ever have. And in premarital counseling sessions, this is one of the things we talk about. We ask the question, well, where did you get your conflict resolution skills from? Was it, was it scripture? Was it the Jesus we meet in Matthew 18? Or, or was it your parents? Who is reflected in your responses and your defense mechanisms? And even our own kids, they can reveal a great deal about ourselves. There's a story in Amazing Grace, What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey, about a husband and wife who are having some struggles in their marriage. And one night, the husband, he just pounds the table and he says, I hate you. I won't take it anymore. I've had enough. I won't go on. I won't let it happen. No, no, no. And it was a couple months later that he hears something stirring in his two-year-old's bedroom. He goes in there and he hears his own son repeat those exact same words with the same inflection in his sleep. The truth is, is that these things have been passed down to us far before our parents. I mean, it's way back in Genesis, when we see sin first entering the picture. In Genesis 3, we find the first conflict between humanity and God and humanity and humanity. It's also the first time we see the blame game. We see Adam saying, well, the woman you put here gave me some of that to eat. Essentially, this isn't my fault, this is your fault, and it is her fault, and here we see that humanity has struggled ever since with conflict and with sin. And what is sin? In the original Greek in this passage, it's the Greek word harmateus. And this word, if you think to yourself, well, I've never harmateus to anyone. Well, this word can mean sin. It can mean missing the mark. It can mean making a mistake, making an error, doing something wrong. And in the Bible, we see that sins can be intentional and unintentional. And the truth is, I think all of us have done plenty of harmateusing in our relationships. One of the ways we can determine whether we're being real about harmateusing in our relationships is having to deal with the fact of, we have to think to ourselves, when was the last time I apologized to somebody? And that reveals a great deal about how real we are. When was the last time I apologized to my spouse or to my children or to my neighbor, my coworkers, a friend? And if it's been a long time, there's probably a problem there. And I'm not saying we're supposed to be a whole culture of sorriers, but there is something about being real And being aware of our sinfulness and just saying, you know what, I shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't have done it like that. The truth is, is that if we look back at a broken relationship and we only can see what that person did wrong, that's probably an issue as well because Paul says all, all have sinned and all have been sinned against, even by those who love us. And so what does Jesus tell us to do? He says, when you sin, you're supposed to take responsibility. And when you are sinned against, you're supposed to take responsibility. Go to that person revealing that hurt. The sinny or the sinned against is supposed to somehow take responsibility in this moment, revealing it to that person. And if that person does not admit harmateus, if they don't admit sin or error or a mistake, if they don't go, man, I shouldn't have done it like that or I didn't mean to do it like that, if they don't, then... You go and you bring in a third party. You don't do it for the sake of triangulation. You don't do it to tag team that person in submission. That person's supposed to be a witness. 
A witness who comes to that kind of meeting expecting to see true reconciliation between a brother and, brother and brother in Christ, a sister and sister in Christ, siblings, they expect to see God do something tremendous. That's what they're there to witness. That's what they go into that meeting with. And if that doesn't work, and then you bring it to the body of believers, to a whole bunch of other sinners who are just trying to get it right so that that group of people can empower and inspire them towards true forgiveness and redemption. And then Jesus says, if that doesn't work, treat him like a tax collector or a pagan. We all know how Jesus treated tax collectors and pagans. He loved them till the end. He came for the sick, which means that there's still time for them too. What do we do though when somebody comes to us they're looking for us to be their, their soundboard. We have to ask them that quintessential question, have you done Matthew 18? Have you done those seven simple steps where if there is a conflict, you go to the person in private to talk about the problem for the purpose of reconciliation? Have you done those seven simple steps or am I enabling you to circumvent this process of true reconciliation that Jesus has in mind for all of us? Have you done Matthew 18? And Grace Fellowship, we need this. We do. These instructions need to be our mode of operation, how we interact with each other. In one of my former youth ministries, there was a Sunday school teacher that was struggling with their co-teacher. And I asked them, well, have you talked about these, some of these problems with them? And they said, oh, yeah, I mention things all the time. And I'm thinking, Jesus doesn't say anything about mentioning anything here. He doesn't say that we should, you know, say comments here and there when something's bothering us. No, he's calling us to have a heart-to-heart conversation for the purpose of better understanding one another and finding a new way forward. Well, can I send an email? No, 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 you can't. I get it, though. This is not easy. In fact, it's one of the hardest things we will ever do because as James says in James 4.1, our flesh is the source of conflict in this situation. There is so much pulling us away from doing this and embracing what Jesus' vision is. And the truth is the hard spiritual things, those are the ones that really grow us. And if we're not having growing pains in our walk with Christ, are we really walking with Christ? Sometimes we think the grown-up thing to do is to pretend like we're not bothered, to pretend like, well, that doesn't really affect me, or we don't care. Another grown-up thing to do is to be stubborn, to be set in our ways, or to not talk to that person. But all of those things are the opposite of maturity in Christ. And if we use any of those kind of mechanisms, any of those kind of processes when we deal with the conflict, we're never going to grow in the most important relationship. And the truth is, is that... These are things that we could easily pass on to our kids. The apple does not fall far from the tree. If they see us talk about the person but not talk to the person, if they see us slander them or tear apart their image or point out every fault but not actually go and reconcile with that person, they're going to think that is the normal. If they see self-preservation as the number one MO in relationships, that's going to hinder them from thriving and flourishing in the body of Christ and in Jesus in general. The Bible makes it quite clear that our horizontal relationships actually affect our relationship with God. If we don't love our neighbor, we're not loving God. If we've wronged somebody and we haven't gone and reconciled it, he doesn't want our offering. I mean, Jesus made it clear in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us it's pretty clear that to this Father in heaven, our relationships with one another are tantamount. They are massively important to our relationship with him. 
And this is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, he says, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. And I think this has always been God's greater purpose when it comes to us and our relationships. It's like a parent who tells two siblings, first you need to go and resolve this. You need to figure this out together. He's blessed when we do that. He is honored when we do that. And the truth is, when we, invo- when we avoid reconciliation, we avoid the Prince of Peace. Let me say that again. When we avoid reconciliation, we avoid God. We avoid the God that we would actually meet if we forgave and buried the hatchet. I love what the psalmist describes about that God. It says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not accuse nor harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our inequities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as east is from west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Hashtag relationship goals. Amen. There's a husband and wife duo who have a podcast that I listen to almost every week. And last week they were talking about their weekly fight. Their weekly fight that they have on while they're recording their podcast. And how when they have this fight, and it could be maybe something that was small that was blown out of proportion. Let's, let's all raise our hand if we've all been guilty of that in a relationship. Um, it could be a tone of voice or a veiled comment. Let's raise our hand if we've all been guilty of that. But whatever it is, whatever is causing this fight, they stop what they're doing. They turn off the recorder. They go downstairs and they talk about it. And then they come back and carry on with what they're doing together. And that, I think, is what Jesus is describing here for the body of Christ. Those little moments that might seem like interruptions or inconveniences, but are actually far more important than the stuff before and after. Because these relationships mean so much to this God who wants us to forgive as we have been forgiven. And I love how what they'll tell this story about how they send their editor two different files, the file before and the file after the fight, and they ask him to cut off the fight at the end of the first file as if it never happened. And it reminds me of the God of, I think, Psalm 103, who keeps no record of our wrongs. Sorry, Psalm 130, who keeps no record of our wrongs. Again, hashtag relationship goals. But let's be real here. Is there a, maybe a period of time in one of your relationships that you wish you could just edit out? The truth is, is we can't. But because we've been forgiven, we can forgive. We can wipe that slate clean, like Danielle described earlier. And while the memory remains of the sin and the hurt, the memory is also there of the forgiveness and the redemption. Hashtag relationship goals. You might be asking yourself, though, what's the purpose of all this? I love the message translation that Danielle read earlier. It says, if a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell them, work it out between the two of you. And if they listen, you made a friend. If they won't listen, take one or two others along so that the presence of witnesses will keep things honest and try again. If he still won't listen, tell the church. If he won't listen to the church, you'll have to start over from scratch, confront him with the need for repentance, and offer again God's forgiving love. Take this most seriously. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. When you say, one, say to one another is eternal, and I mean this, when two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. Where two or three are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there as well. And this is Jesus' vision. We're bringing very broken people who don't always get it right and often get it wrong together in his name into community. But first it involves these awkward, messy conversations. That's the goal in mind is that we don't live our lives like these lone islands. 
Donna Miller in Blue Like Jazz, he, he talks about uh, living in a house with three other dudes and how much this taught about himself, how much it taught about how he viewed the world around him, and it caused him to question things that he had, he had held to before, certain worldviews. It challenged him. It, it made him grow personally, emotionally, and spiritually. And he says, living in community made me realize one of my faults. I was addicted to myself. All I thought about was myself, and the only thing I cared about was myself. I had very little concept of love or sacrifice. I discovered that my mind is like a radio that picks up only one station, the one that plays me, K-Don, all Don, all the time. And having had my way for so long, I became defensive about what I perceived as encroachments on my rights. My personal bubble is huge. I couldn't have conversations that lasted more than 10 minutes. I wanted efficiency in personal interaction, and while listening to one of my housemates talk, I wondered when they would finally get to the point. Why are you, what are you trying to tell me, I would think? Do you really have to stand here and make small talk? One of my roommates later told me that in the first few months of living with me, he felt judged as though there was something wrong with him. He felt unvalued any time he was around me. The most difficult lie I ever contended with is this. Life is a story about me, but it's not. You see, life, it's a story about a God who makes us into one new humanity, who actually brings us into community, who actually brings messy people together. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said, if you can't stand living in community, beware of being alone. John Orpreg, he shares a story, a humorous story that's not real about a, a man who was marooned on an island, and they came and they found him, and he showed them around before they left the island. He showed them the house, the hut he had built, and the little cabana he kind of had, and then he brought them to his church that he had built, and they said, well, what's this building next to it? And he's like, that's where I used to go to church. And <laughs> it's this understanding that even in us, there's a conflict at war, and so how... If we are always at conflict, how can we not think that we're going to be at conflict with others? And the truth is that God somehow brings us into these messy relationships in order to make these people one in his name. And it's tremendous and it's powerful and it's uncomfortable and it's awkward and it grows us. And it's so hard to do. And it requires tough things like forgiveness. And you might be asking yourself, well, how many times am I supposed to forgive? I mean, that's what Peter asked Jesus right? It was like we heard earlier, Peter asked, well, how many times am I supposed to forgive my brother or sister? And in the ancient Jewish world, there was certain perimeters set to filter out repeat offenders. Uh, limitations for how much a person could be forgiven. According to the Jewish Talmud, if a man has a transgression the first, the second, and the third time he is forgiven, the fourth time he is not. Now, if that is the bar, I'm out. I think all of us are until we meet this Jesus, the Jesus who says, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times or seven times 70. Hashtag relationship goals, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, aren't we just enabling people? Well, if they ask for forgiveness and we give it to them, we are enabling. We are enabling them and us to experience the unfathomable, unbelievable grace of God in our lives. We're enabling. We're putting ourselves in the pole position to actually experience the grace that was given to us when we didn't deserve it on the cross. We are enabling we're enabling people to be pardoned like they had never imagined, like they had maybe only hoped for. We are enabling. It's true. But is there anything better to enable in this world? I dare say not. Now, it's important to have boundaries. I just want to talk about that. Boundaries are important in your life. But it's important to know whether certain boundaries are there for self-preservation or self-protection. And what I mean by self-preservation is this. If you have boundaries set up in order to keep people at bay who might grow you, challenge you, and cause you to bear spiritual fruit you are not bearing in your life, that's not a good boundary. 
the kind of boundaries that keep people from continually hurting us who are unrepentant and aren't willing to stop, those are important boundaries and we shouldn't be yoked with those people. But we're still called to forgive because holding on to forgiveness is like drinking our own poison. And I think about this as somebody who threw up in the gathering space this last week. There are some things that we ingest in this world, some kinds of brokenness or things done to us, and if we hold them in us, they're just going to make us sick. I say this as my six-year-old was throwing up at two o'clock last night. There's stuff in him that he needs to get rid of, and that's all of us. Forgiveness has a way of bringing about a healing that we never could imagine. And it's just like we heard earlier from Danielle. It adds years to our life. It's so freeing. It's so, so good. And it's God's vision for us. It's what he wants for you and for me. And I have this friend whose father was on his deathbed. And he gets a visit from a former council member of one of his former churches, a person he said he would never talk to ever again. And this guy is there for reconciliation, f- to seek forgiveness, and he gets it. And I can imagine the Father in heaven looking down, smiling, because these are the children of God. It's like Jesus said in Matthew 5, the peacemakers are the children of God, and so are we. We've been made to be peacemakers and when, and when we forgive, when we forgive, it is godly, and we are made in God's likeness. When we seek forgiveness, it is humbling, but we're also made to be humble. We were made for this. And the truth is, is you might be one conversation away from experiencing both God's peace that he wants to impart in your life and also making you a conduit of God's peace in somebody's life. You might be one awkward conversation, one door from opening up that could forever mend a situation or a relationship. You might be one conversation from experiencing one of the most powerful things in this planet, the forgiveness that Jesus actually calls his people to empower and to do for one another. It One conversation, it could be just like one door opening up, that easy. And you might be thinking, well, what is the big deal? The big deal is this. We're made for this. We need this. And what happens when we reconnect, when we've been apart from each other, is so different than the world we see out there. And when we do it in our marriages, when we do this in our relationships with our children, which, by the way, one of the hardest things as a parent to do is to say, I'm sorry, to admit maybe I should have done that differently. When we do this with our friends and our coworkers and our, our, our neighbors, and we do this with, with people in our lives, it, it takes people back. I mean, I remember one of my, my sons asking when we were out in Washington, how come people um, never say I, um, they forgive me when I apologize to them at school? And I was like, this is a very Christian concept going on here. We have a niche. We have something special because we have experienced forgiveness. We can offer somebody something that people, unless they experience the forgiveness of Christ, will never be able to fully understand or or offer to other people. This is unique and special. And that's what Jesus is calling us to right here. And Garrison Keillor, I'm going to leave us with this story. He tells the story of a, a church that's divided over really silly stuff. He says... The congregation was cursed with a surplus of scholars and a deficit of peacemakers. And one dispute had to do with whether or not it was right to show hospitality to those in doctrinal error. And Uncle Al decided to try to make peace between the warring factions. The leaders were Brother Miller and Brother Johnson. And Al worked with an intermediary, Brother Fields, who had never shown hospitality to anyone, whether they're in error or not and was therefore judged to be neutral on the issue. They all arrived one Sunday for Aunt Flo's famous fried chicken. They came in their Fords, being united on the General General Motors question. And the, the grace before the meal posed a problem, though. Church members sometimes were known to seize prayer and beat over each other's heads with it. And so Uncle Al had everyone pray silently. It became the longest table grace in history as people sat there waiting out their opponents. 
It ground on and on and on. And then Aunt Flo slid her chair back, rose, went to the kitchen, and brought out the food that they were all competing to see who could be the most thankful. And then suddenly, tears streamed down Brother Johnson's face, and Brother Miller was weeping. It's true what they say, that smell is the key that unlocks our deepest memories. And with their eyes closed, the smell of fried chicken and gravy made these men into boys again. It was years ago they were fighting, and a mother's voice from on high said, You two stop it and get in here and have your dinner. Now I mean it. And that's the God we meet in Matthew 18. You see, God actually calls us to worship under this one roof as one body, to eat at the same table and eat bread from the same loaf and drink from the same cup and sing with one voice to the one true God. He calls us to do this. And he's given us this one incredible love that's supposed to empower all the other relationships. It's like Jesus says in John chapter 13, they will know me when you love one another. He brings us into a space like this to do tremendous, powerful things that we never could fathom in our lives. And sometimes we think to ourselves, well, this relationship is never going to work out. That person will never change. But I love this quote from Ed Harris's character in Apollo 13. When everything seemed lost, when all the odds were stacked against them, he said, on the contrary, with all due respect, I believe this is our finest hour. And that's what Jesus calls us to in Matthew 18, to our finest hour. When something is against us, something feels like it cannot be fixed, and yet he somehow brings people together. This is our finest hour. And the truth is is that he wants wants to do that in our lives. He wants Matthew 18 to work through all of our different relationships, to do tremendous things. And right now, He's telling us that this is our relationship goals, which means we might have some hatchets to bury, some olive branches to extend, some doors to reopen, some apologies to make, some forgiveness to give. But I dare say this might be our finest hour. Please pray with me. Jesus, we can't do any of this without you. We both need your wisdom and your instructions. We also need you, Spirit. We need you to bear fruit in us that maybe we're struggling to bear right now. We need you to pull us in directions that maybe we're avoiding. We need you to reopen doors, repair bridges, reconnect hearts, and help us to see you in all of our relationships. We pray for every home, every home. As we leave these walls today, we pray for every home that Matthew 18, that that understanding and being real with each other and finding a new way to communicate with each other. May you bless parents as they're figuring that out. May you bless spouses. May you bless the people of God as they're trying to figure out how to do this in this community and in their own communities when they leave here. Help us to embrace those awkward or uncomfortable conversations knowing that this might be our finest hour. And all of God's people say.
brothers and sisters, may we sense the Father smiling down on us as we make peace with the other children of God. And may Jesus' seven simple instructions be our relationship goals in every relationship in our lives. May the Spirit give us that humility and strength and forgiveness from God to go and forgive others. And all of God's people say... Oh, hey, can we pause for a second? I want to bring Lindsay Jansen up front. My apologies, I forgot something today. So Lindsay is going to Michigan. And she's been a part of our church family for a very long time. And we're going to miss her. I want to pray that the Spirit guides her. That God goes with her into this new season, this new adventure that she senses that Jesus is with her every step of the way. All right? And after uh, we do this blessing, I want um, everyone to get a chance to go and ask her what God has in store for her and let her know you'll be praying for her. (sighs) Can I put my hand on your shoulder? Is that okay? Father, I lift up my, my sister, Lindsay, and I pray that you go before her, beneath her, above her, behind her, that you lead her into this new season In the moments when she doesn't know what's next, may you be that fire by night and cloud by day. May you be her shepherd, Jesus, over every mountain and through every valley. And equip her with new gifts, new fruit for the season ahead. Help her to get excited as she follows you, Jesus, into this moment. Amen. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, yeah, redemption's hill, where your blood was spilled, for my ransom. 